right? Um, so officially, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adara Goldberg, and I am the director here at the Holocaust Resource Center of Kane University. It is a pleasure to present today's program in partnership with The Forward. And of course, this will be a conversation about the new podcast, Playing Anne Frank. Um, this session will run as a conversation between our moderator, Shauna Stein, and the podcast creator, Adam Langer. There will be an opportunity at the end for question and answer, um, but please do feel free to utilize the chat box um, if you have anything pressing that you don't want to forget, and I will be sure that we get to that at the end. And so our two speakers today, the first is Shauna Stein. Shauna is a dear friend of the Holocaust Resource Center who has been teaching at Montclair High School for 24 years. And she currently teaches our dual credit course on Holocaust Genocide and Modern Humanity, Women's Studies and Cultural Pluralism. Um, Shauna is also an instructor in the post bac certificate in teaching the Holocaust and prejudice reduction. Um, she is an Alfred Lerner Fellow through the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous, and she was on the team that just redesigned the curriculum for the New Jersey um, Commission on Holocaust Education. Um, she won Teacher of the Year at Montclair High School in 2013, among many other awards. Um, Adam Langer is the creator and the host of Playing Anne Frank. He is also the executive editor of The Forward and the author of one memoir and five novels. These include Cyclorama, published in 2022, which traces the lives of actors in a 1980s high school production of The Diary of Anne Frank um, that was put on in suburban Chicago. So I am going to turn things over to Shauna and Adam. Um, and again, thank you everyone for being here. I'm looking forward to a really enlightening conversation. Thank you so much, Adara, for that lovely introduction. Um, Adam, why don't we just start with you telling us about what your spark was to, to tell this story? Well, first, I just want to uh, thank you and Adara for um, having me to discuss uh, the podcast, as well as the novel Cyclorama, which may or may not enter into the discussion as we go forward. And thanks to all of you for spending part of your Monday afternoon for a discussion of this podcast and whatever my spark of inspiration might have been. I guess um, the inspiration for the podcast, playing Anne Frank, resulted from the fact that I had written this novel that Adara uh, mentioned called Cyclorama, which traces the lives of 10 high school students who perform in an ill-fated production of the Diary of Anne Frank. And the novel traces the story of this high school production through the eyes of the 10 main characters of the Diary of Anne Frank. It shows what happened when they were high school students. And then it goes into the 21st century about 35 years later to show how the impact of this production still reverberated for each of the characters um, in the play and in the novel. And when I was done, and the novel was about to be published maybe a year, year and a half ago, um, no, actually, actually less than that, maybe let's, let's call it a year ago, I was interested in finding out what the real story was. So I had written about these fictional characters who had been in the Diary of Anne Frank, and I wondered, what happened to the people who were in the original Broadway cast? The Broadway show opened in 1955. Um, it toured the country in 1958. There was a film in 1959. And I just started to try and find if I could find out anyone who was could tell me about those productions. And to my pleasant surprise, there were a lot of people who were there, who were in the Broadway production, who toured the country with it, who were in the 1959 film. And I started to ask them to tell me their stories, to see if this one particular piece of art impacted them in some way, and if so, how. And so that was the spark of it. It was writing a novel, and I toggle a lot between fiction and nonfiction. And this was, I wanted, I had told the fake story, I wanted to know the true one. Oh, that's fantastic. What 
Um, so how did the project come about? Where did you start? I believe it, it, you know, it's always, I was trying to find like the first people I could find. So I went, you know, phone books, old phone directories. I don't remember the first person I found. One of the first people I found was an actor named uh, Steve Press who uh, played Peter Van Dan on Broadway. He was not the original Peter Van Dan, and but he was a stage manager on the show and he wound up taking on the role. And I just found him in upstate New York and we got to talking about his experience. And it was a fairly remarkable experience because he in particular was probably in this show more than anybody in the history of the show. He was in it on Broadway, when the show closed on Broadway, he hit the road. He was on a national tour that played Chicago and Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. When that closed, there was something that was known as the bus and truck tour, which I had not heard about, which was in 1958. Once the show had played these major cities, it had play, played and closed on Broadway. Um, the producers are like, well, we think this is a really meaningful and powerful story, and I think a lot of people could benefit from it. We're going to try touring small American towns. We're going to go to, you know, Fayetteville, Arkansas. We're going to go to Birmingham, Alabama. We're going, which is not that small of a town, anyone who comes from there, I, I, I realize that, but we're going to go to Fort Wayne, Texas. And they wound up touring a hundred different cities. And so um, I spoke to him about his experience, and then I tried to find the fate of everyone who was in the show, and it took a lot of internet searches, looks for old newspapers. And I found, you know, dozens of people who were either in the show, in the film, were perhaps the son or a grandson of a, you know, a set designer. I was very dismayed that a number of the people who were involved in the production did not have kids. I would have liked to have talked to them, but, you know, they, you know, dedicated themselves to their art instead of raising a family, which is their you know, entitled to do, but wasn't so great for my podcast. But um, so it was just a matter of trying to find as many stories as I could and following the history. Like, and once I was done with the Broadway show, I wanted to know what happened when I went around the country. Once I was done with finding out what happened around the country, I wanted to know what happened next. What, how did the movie get made? Mm -hmm. There was a musical, how did that get made? Mm -hmm. On up until today, where I spent some time talking to high school students who had just been in the production in 2021 and 2022. Obviously, they don't have the same um, expansive view of history as the people who were in the show in 1955 and 1958. But I, I wanted to know their stories as well, to know how performing in this show, creating it, directing it, playing these characters, what sort of impact that had on them. What was um, your own connection to the Diary of Anne Frank? Did you read it growing up? Did you read it? In yeah, I mean, I, my connection to the Diary of Anne Frank was not a remarkable one. It was the same as probably lots of people from my generation were. We read it in school. Um, I The play was performed at my high school. I actually didn't see that production. But um, I, I wouldn't want to say that I had a special relationship to it. Um, it affected me the same way it did hundreds of thousands of millions of other people. And when exactly I read it, I assume it it's hard to remember a time when I didn't know it. So I'm assuming it was middle school, but it, the memory of that is faded. Was there anything um, like really unexpected or surprising that you came across in your interviews? Everything, really. Yeah. Because, um, you know, you you write a novel and you start to think, you know, you're making this up. Why would one show have more impact than any other show? Um, I grew up, you know, performing in shows and they all had some impact on my life, but it would take a very special show to have the sort of effect where everyone in it would remember it mm -hmm. and have it be a life changing experience. And everyone like I talked to um, the set designer, actually, I am speaking with a Zoom background uh, behind me. I'm going to just tilt up my screen a bit. Um, this is the original set design of the Diary of Anne Frank. And the um, artist was a set designer who um, theater aficionados will have heard of. His name was Boris Aronson. And he, and, and if you'll notice that the kind of, kind of the way, the kind of the fanciful depiction of it 
smacks a little bit of Marc Chagall, and he was a contemporary of Chagall's. And I spoke to his son, and it was, you know, I was trying to figure out how this show, what did this mean to this particular guy, Boris Aronson? He designed hundreds of shows that won Tony Awards. He designed Fiddler on the Roof. He designed eight, like, everything Stephen Stondheim did in the 1970s he designed. And what was interesting in particular about the Diary of Anne Frank was he was designing this claustrophobic set, this set where, you know, these people could not leave their um, hiding place. And it had a sort of a thematic and metaphorical resonance for him particularly because he had had to leave Russia during the time of the pogroms. He had to leave to come to America because of persecution. So the persecution he had experienced uh, in Kiev um, was on a metaphorical level transferable to this uh, set that he designed, to these lives. So he kind of had a kind of visceral feeling of what he was designing. At the same time, um, the person who played the character of Mr. Dussel, the dentist who was uh, hiding out with the Franks and Van Dan families, actually the Van Pelses in real life, the Van Tans in the film and the uh, stage play. Um, it turned out the actor whose name was Gil Jack Gil Guilford, who some of you may know, um, he was in this show and he found a refuge of sorts because he was labeled as a communist by the House on American Activities Committee. And so his experience in Anne Frank finding this sort of refuge, um, his character, the play is finding a refuge. And at the same time, he as a person is finding a sort of refuge as well. So that's those are just two of the things that came up. But everyone had a very particular story that was individual, that was surprising, and that showed the impact that this one particular piece of art had that reverberated. Um, it's so true there. The, the story itself was so important in the 1950s for so many reasons. Um, can you talk more about what those reasons were and you know, what does it say perhaps about America's interest in the Holocaust in the 50s or even in Jewish stories in the 50s? Well, it's, um, you know, it, it's sometimes we look back at the Diary of Anne Frank, and if you look at it without, you look at the film, for example, the 1959 film that was directed by George Stevens that starred uh, Millie Perkins and Joseph Schulkraut, you look at it and it can seem a little stagey, it can seem a little hokey, it can seem a little sentimental, it can seem a little long. Um, but you go back to look at what was happening at the time, and you realize that kind of the sensibility behind it and the reason for its importance. One of the things that really stunned me, I mean, I don't know if it stunned me, but it's just something I hadn't thought of before because I, I wasn't there when the show premiered on Broadway, is that, or toured the country, is that there was we're talking from the about the Holocaust Education Resource Center now that that was not a thing in 1955 Holocaust education like where I grew up going to like the auditorium to hear Holocaust survivors speak like I noticed last night that the Academy and the Academy Awards left out the actor Robert Clary from Hoven's Heroes who was a Holocaust survivor um, who became an actor and used to lecture around the country and that was our speaker in high school was Robert Clary spoke to us about his Holocaust experience. This was not done. This was, you know, Jews at this time were largely changing their names to pass to be in Hollywood. There were a few movies that spoke about the Jewish experience, like there was, uh, you know, a film noir, I believe it was called Crossfire that came out about anti-Semitism. There was Marjorie Morningstar that came out around this time. There was Gentleman's Agreement. But, you know, they were just things that were kind of touching around the edges. And the idea of Holocaust education in some way started with Anne Frank. Mm -hmm. It started with this play touring the country, going to places where people had not 
met a Jewish person, did not know about the Holocaust, maybe had heard about it in passing. And I think that was what the producers of the show had in mind. And though they didn't phrase it this way was America needs to be educated about this tragedy, this uh, horrible occurrence. And how do we do that? How do we humanize the story? How do we bring it home? This was a time um, when uh, the show was playing. This was before the Civil Rights Act. This is when Jews weren't being allowed into country clubs. This is during Jim Crow times. This was, you know, um, this was a time when these stories were being told for the first time. And that was what began to resonate with the people who performed it, the people who saw it. And it's, you know, lots of plays toured the country, but I think very few of them had the impact that this one had because what they were doing had not been done before. Can you say more about that? What, what had not been done before? I mean, to take the story of the Holocaust, to bring it around America. I mean, there were stories in newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, there, you know, certainly, you know, there was footage out there that people might have seen, but to take this story and actually bring it home to the people who were unaware of it, that was, that was something from, to my knowledge, and what I've discovered through the creation of this podcast, that was something new. Yeah. So, um, you know, how does this then help us understand the role of the arts in introducing people to the history of the Holocaust? Well, I mean, I think it, it's really hard to find like a one to one sort of correspondence like this has teaching this has this effect. But what I found remarkable about the people I spoke with or even the people I didn't speak to who had performed in this play or had created this play is how many, you know, from that moment on, it didn't feel like they were just plain actors anymore. They were just plain artists. A lot of them really felt a sense of social responsibility. One of the most remarkable things that I found um, was the actor who played Peter Van Dan. Um, who some of you may know, his name is Richard Beamer. He uh, played Tony in West Side Story, the movie. And, you know, I, he didn't do interviews a lot. I didn't get in touch with him. He didn't return my calls or my emails. Um, but after Diary of Anne Frank, you know, his acting career was very sporadic. But what he did do was go down to Mississippi to register um, Black students to vote. What he did was to do a documentary of the experience of registering voters in Mississippi. And in this documentary, and I play part of this in the podcast, um, the last line he quotes when he's talking about civil rights in Mississippi is he's quoting Anne Frank. He's quoting, you know, in spite of everything, I still believe that people are good at heart. And he is directly bringing his experience of playing this role into his mm -hmm. political activism. And that was something that I found remarkable about the people who were kind of had their own education through Anne Frank. A lot of them, you know, stopped acting. I mean, they tried to pers they pursued different careers. One of them became a psychologist. Um, they became involved. One of them was a um, became a social worker. Um, one of them lectured students. Um, and it seemed like if they had been in a different play, their lives would not have taken this turn. They, they would have had a very different trajectory, but being, <clears throat> excuse me, exposed to this story, being able to live this story, to understand it and to bring it to people gave them a real sense of social responsibility. And that's what struck me is that something that the arts can do is bring stories home to me in a people that some way that people like sometimes lecture and sometimes history and sometimes books cannot at least that was true for the people i spoke with who were in the production and even <clears throat> talking to teenagers now like um in one of the last episodes i did i talked to um four girls who played Anne frank in duluth minnesota and waynesville north carolina and 
Groton, Massachusetts, in Tacoma, Washington. And you can hear them, you can hear their voices. They're range from 12 to 18 years old. Like they're thinking about maybe I want to be a teacher. Maybe I want to be a uh, work in medicine. And you can tell in part, it's because of this experience they had of playing, like finding empathy for the roles and the situations they were playing. Hmm. That's, that's fantastic. I mean, we talk about um, in education, trying to reach students, you know, through the head and the heart. And it seems, you know, you can give statistics, you can, they can be reading scholarly materials, but, you know, it's, it's through these stories that really are what touch people and, and help them make these connections. Um, well, I thought one of the most compelling parts of the podcast was when you talked about it being on the road and, yeah. um, and what it was like being down in, in the Jim Crow era in the South and police escorts. And I'm also curious if you could talk more about the experience of taking it to Germany and all the way, you know, all, I think it, I think 90 cities they performed this play in 90 different cities. Yeah, that's um I, I really wanted to talk to the actor who played Anne Frank in Germany, but she is in poor health. Um, and, you know, if you look, I mean, I went into the archives of the producers and the, the, yeah, there were 90 productions in Germany alone. And there was an article that spoke that the wait list for students who re wanted to see this play was 30,000 people. So it was sold out and 30,000 people were on the wait list. And um, I, I spoke to one of the actors who originated the role of Peter Van Dan on Broadway and talked about what a moving experience it was, even though he didn't necessarily understand the language, but to see um, this show that he knew so intimately being performed in a country where it certainly would not have allowed to be performed 10, 15 years earlier was an incredibly profound experience. And, you know, if you look at it, uh, in terms of how this play spread in the matter of just a couple of years, um, I, I really hadn't seen anything like it. You see productions in South Africa, you see five productions in five different languages in South America. You see it in the, the only place uh, someone asked me uh, in an interview a couple of weeks ago about Japan. I have did not see anything about a production of the Diary of Anne Frank in Japan, but that was um, kind of the rarity. It just spread everywhere. People wanting to hear the story, wanting to experience the story. And perhaps lives being changed by this story as well, um, you know, from one continent to the next. Why do you think it's still so wildly popular? What, what does this Diary of Anne Frank, it, you know, how, what does it say to us in our contemporary time? Well, I mean, why this story and not a different story? It's, you know, I mean, some of it, is both to the credit and the detriment of the people who um, adapted it to the stage. Um, what, what's interesting about the people who adapted and I go into the story is a bit is that the original person who wanted to adapt it was a Jewish writer, a fairly fiery gentleman who was a very well-known novelist at the time named Meyer Levin, uh, who also wrote the uh, film about the Leopold and Loeb murders, uh, Compulsion. And his, um, his original script was very didactic, very Jewish, much more true in a way, well, not in a way, much more true to the words of Anne Frank. What happened was um, the people who knew things about Broadway and knew about how Hollywood worked thought that wouldn't work. They wanted this show to have a greater impact. So it was, you know, it was Hollywoodized to some effect. Um, the screenwriters that were brought onto it were not Jewish. They were the people who had written uh, Hepburn and Tracy comedies. They had written It's a Wonderful Life uh, with Jimmy Stewart. And they put 
what a lot of critics later have said, I put a very sentimental gloss on it. Um, it's nowhere near as Jewish as it was in the original draft. Um, it was, um, you know, it, it's some people have said, and I, I don't argue with it, that, you know, they make Anne Frank in the film and the bride is kind of Christ-like. It's a, it's a, it's a show, it's a show that has broad appeal for all that means from a positive and a negative sort of way. So by creating this, you know, that's slightly Hollywoodized, slightly sentimentalized, they created something that could connect with people in parts of the country where they had not uh, met, did not know anything about the Jewish experience and could relate to it a little more. You can argue with, you know, the philosophy about that, but I think that's a great reason for its popularity is that it was very intentionally made to be universal. And from there, it just kind of snowballed and it became the show that every high school did. I went to look through um, um, research that was done by the Edu Educational Theater Association. And you look at the top 10 plays that were performed in high schools and community theaters, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 90s, and the first decade of the 21st century, there are two play, three plays that are on that list. It is Our Town, it mm -hmm. is Midsummer Night's Dream, and it's The Diary of Anne Frank. Wow. Um, you know, there are certainly pitfalls to be aware of when dramatizing events of the Holocaust. Um, how does the play deal with those? I mean, what's something I found, it, I mean, it, I mean, I think, I, I think it falls into some of those pitfalls sometimes. I don't think it avoids them completely. Um, I, I don't know how familiar people are with the play and the film, but there is a very dramatic scene where they've been in hiding, the Franks and Van Dans for some time, and everyone is beginning to be at each other's throats and they are frightened, they are hungry. And one day in the middle of the night, one night, one of the characters, Mr. Van Dan, sneaks down to um, the kitchen to steal a loaf of bread because he is so hungry. And it is one of the most intense and dramatic moments. It is completely fictional. Mm. It did not happen. And you can read the letters that go back and forth between Otto Frank and Albert Hackett and Francis Goodrich, who uh, wrote it, and Garson Kane, the director, and Otto Frank saying, this did not happen. And them saying, we need a dramatic moment for the audience. And, you know, that's, I mean, that's, that's the pitfall. You're trying to, you know, life does not always correspond to the conventions of a two act drama or uh, a 120 minute movie and things, liberties are taken. And, you know, you know I mean, I think you created something resonant and moving, but you also created something untrue. And um, whether that's to the benefit of or detriment of generations, I, I really don't know the answer to that question. I don't know, but I know I do know that there were moments like that that happened. And even you know, with the diary itself, where you know it took years before the unexpurgated version to come out. Mm -hmm. So you know, people who, I, I think the people who were creating the drama, creating the play, were doing so with the best of intentions, wanting this story to resonate, wanting it to matter, wanting it to change the people's lives. And I believe it did. But, you know, with some hindsight, you, the kind of the, the liberties that were taken can make one a little queasy when one looks at them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the podcast, I, I enjoyed the conversation about how different people took different things. And so maybe the adults were watching the play and thinking about the Holocaust and the story and family and loss, but that the young people were seeing this love story. Yeah. Man yeah. And Peter. yeah, I mean, as, you know, as an artist, as, you know, working in theater, I mean, you, you know, at a certain point, you want it, the art to resonate for whatever reason that it does. You want it to have that impact. And, 
you know, at a certain point, if, it, you know, but you, and, and, and that was one of the interesting things about the play too, is that it did um, have this ability to enchant the young and the old at the same time, which is, you know, one of the beauties of a piece of art and the one of the beauties of a piece of art is that it can affect you know each audience member in a different way and each generation in a different way hmm. i found that as the most moving part of the podcast was when the actors who were now much much older were playing their roles and they oh that was the most <laughs> that was such a touching moment yeah. and well, when, yeah, 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 that's and and we will be recreating that moment on April second okay. at the um, Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York. Two of the actors who were in they played Anne and Peter in the road show that played 101 Cities, and they played Peter and Anne then, and they hadn't really seen or talked to each other since 1958. And after I had talked to both of them, one of the things that struck me was that. You know, you had 717 performances on Broadway. You had this national tour that played maybe a hundred, a couple hundred times. You toured a hundred cities. That this, you know, if this happened now, you would have hundreds of YouTube videos. There is nothing. There is no video of these performances. I, you know, there are cups, there are news clippings, but there are no photographs that I've found. Like there's no audio interviews. I assume these people were interviewed by local radio. There's no evidence of that. And I thought, I really want to get these voices down. Even if they're much older, I want to have some record of these people playing these roles. Because <clears throat> one of the actors I spoke with was talking about one of the reasons she left theater was that she said, there's nothing left in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, it's this very ephemeral thing. And for this thing to have mattered so much and to be so ephemeral, I really wanted mm -hmm. there to be evidence of it. So I asked them, can you read a little bit? Can you read a couple scenes? And both of them, they still have their scripts. They still have their notes from 1964. You can see a couple pictures that we took, which actually have some of the script with some of the notes on it. And, you know, you can, e even though they're much older, you can imagine them playing the roles. You can get a sense of what it might have been like. Yeah, I think what's so striking is just how young they were and um, and the loss of it all. The loss of it all that um, certainly as an adult has hit me differently than when I read it as a kid or even saw the play. I saw the revival with Natalie Portman in the mm -hmm. of Broadway. Um, and it, it just struck me listening to the two actors doing it now, you know, when she says, have you ever kissed a girl? And <laughs> she'll never really get to do that, you know? Yeah. Um, that was just so, so striking. Um, yeah, this play, and she says, was he pretty, was she pretty? Yeah. <laughs> it's really heartbreaking. Yeah, you, you can see on screen um, our, Editorial fellow Matt Littman is showing some of the um, the of Steve Press's script with his notes oh. on it. Um, this is this is the script from 1958 that toured the country. Um, I mean, I, it's you know interesting that you referenced that 1997 production, which was directed by uh, James Lapine and starred Natalie Portman and Austin Pendleton. And that production, you can actually go to the film to the Lincoln Center Library. And you can actually see that video. I went and watched that video. So that's that has been preserved. Um, but you know, now Lincoln Center has a library. You anything that's been on Broadway in the past, I don't know, twenty five maybe years, you can you can see video of that. But before they started doing that, you know, it's all programs, playbills, reviews, and you know, some yellowed newsprint, and it's. You know, as much as we can preserve of that, the better. Um, so I know there are a lot of teachers on the call, hopefully, and you know, there's definitely, uh, I, I certainly can see so many connections that theater teachers would make with the podcast and the English teachers. My husband is an English teacher and he teaches drama and plays. Um, and then of course, as a social studies teacher, um, I think about the Cold War aspect and how the blacklisting and how complicated uh, 
it was for people to be in movies and radio. So they went to plays. There's a lot there. Um, any other, you know, particular parts that you felt would be really valuable for teachers in using it in the classroom? Well, I think what I find, you know, interesting in terms of how it educated me in a way was how, you know, if you delve deep enough into any kind of any significant meaty story that happened in the past, you can see how it touches on other stories. Mm -hmm. So this began as wanting to tell the story of the Dario Band Frank, what, what, what it was like on Broadway, the impact it had. I didn't realize that it would touch, as you mentioned, McCarthyism, um, the anti-Semitic pogroms in Russia in the early part of the 20th century, um, Vietnam, the uh, actor who played Margaret Frank wound up married to a very famous um, uh, chaplain at Yale uh, who was jailed for his protests of the Vietnam War. Um, and you know, it, you take it, why if you kind of zero in enough on one particular incident, it touches everything. Like one of the things I also found fascinating was usually when actors keep their clips of old productions, all you see is, you know, that particular review, but you can't zoom out to see what the other stories were. So I went back to the old newspapers at the time and you look at, you know, uh, okay, the Diary of Anne Frank's playing Birmingham, Alabama in 1958. What else is happening there? Oh, there's a lunch counter boycott, you see. Um, okay, it's playing Little Rock, Arkansas uh, at that time. What else is going on? Oh, Dwight D. Eisenhower is speaking about um, the protests, uh, violent protests about school desegregation. So from a research standpoint, just this idea that history no matter how like important or how significant it is, it's never something isolated. It always, you kind of connects with dozens of other stories. And the, the other thing was just, you know, talking to high school kids today. And, you know, I, I think people can be rather jaded about high school students' experiences and, you know, people don't read, they do TikTok all day or whatever. And, you know, these kids who were in the show were so thoughtful, so well spoken, so earnest, and so affected by it that it gives you, you know, a lot of hope for both these kids, but also for this story and its ability to touch people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in education, we talk about windows and mirrors that sometimes kids need to see themselves reflected back, but also they need to see through windows into. Well, other yeah, 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 that was interesting too. It's like talking to the kids. It's like some. Like some saw windows and so, like some saw mirrors like, yeah, and Frank's just like me, but they were very careful not to read too much of themselves into it. They were very like I would ask just to see what they would say about like, you know, you were uh, do, uh, performing this play and it was delayed because of COVID. Do you feel, mm -hmm. you know, trapped or did, could you relate to the claustrophob claustrophobia? And they were very careful to say like, no. Yeah. that experience is different i get it yeah. and they're th i mean they're 13 15 16 years old they they yeah. got the distinction mm -hmm. yeah i noticed that too um you know i teach holocaust and genocide to mostly 17 18 year olds and my students are so smart and thoughtful about that as well and it's been helpful for them many of them have written about how it's been helpful to be studying a you know, the Holocaust and looking at all of some of the the worst aspects of of our human behavior and and they compare it, but in ways that are really smart and it's helping them get a, a sense of perspective. Um, they know not to compare oppression. They don't, they're not doing that, but they are being really thoughtful about feeling grateful about what they have, you know, through studying this. So I think I think that could really help. Um, okay. It's a good thing for students. Um, so, in in terms of um, of your you know the legacy of of this uh, podcast, what do you hope the legacy of of playing Anne Frank will be? Well, I mean, I um, am very appreciative of the fact that I was able to document the story 
that had not been told before. And when I first, I mean, I, I mean, I grew up in radio, but I haven't done anything audio in a very long time. But when I heard these voices, um, I wanted other people to hear these voices too. I didn't think it would play the same way if I just wrote an oral history, if I wrote a book or I wrote a long article, I wanted these voices to be preserved to be remembered. That was very important to me as I was going through it. And I wanted to tell as many stories as I could. And um, I kind of feel like in some ways I've done seven episodes and a couple bonus episodes. In some ways, I still want to hear other stories of how this and other aspects and, and perhaps other art has affected people as well. I got a note yesterday from someone who I believe is actually even on this call. Uh, I recognized a name in the chat from someone whose sister performed in the play in LaPorte, Indiana mm -hmm. in, in like the 1960s. Um, I'm still trying to get a hold of, there's an Israeli actor who uh, played Anne Frank, was the understudy Anne Frank on Broadway, uh, who lives in Israel now, and I'm still trading, um, what you call it, uh, what saps with her, and I haven't been able to get talk to her yet. But I, I, I feel like this idea of seeing how a piece of art can impact um, lives. I feel I feel it's an ongoing project, and that this isn't the only version of that story I want to tell. Whether it's about Anne Frank or whether it's about something else. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. A lot of students, um, if they know anything about the Holocaust at all, it's they know Anne Frank. And, um, and that's usually students first in entry point into learning anything about the Holocaust. Yeah, and you can argue whether that's a good thing or not, but it's just there's no arguing with it anymore. Right. That's just that's just how it is. That's the world we live in. That is for because of this story when it was told because of this play because of the film because of the hundreds of thousands of productions mm -hmm. um it's that's that is how people yeah. are exposed to the story yeah and there are um compilations of other um of other young people's diaries yeah. from that time period that a lot of teachers use as well to yeah. sort of broaden that single story of anne frank they you know, we pull in, um, there's a, a famous book, Salvage Pages, from Alexandra Zapruder, who edited all these young people's diaries. And you can get a sense that Anne Frank's diary is among many different and, and different um, kinds of stories, different time period, different geography, uh, different outcomes. But um, I, well, I thank you so much for, for your work and I really enjoyed the podcast and I'm thinking of ways that I could use it in my classroom for sure. Um, and at, at this point, I think that it would be really nice to open up to the chat for, um, for some questions from the people in our audience. Excellent. So oh, I'm going to invite anybody who would like to speak um, to please use the function to raise your hand so that we can call on you um, to unmute. And I will throw out the first question from the chat for Adam. Were any of the interviewees Holocaust survivors themselves or did they know of folks who were similarly hidden? Um, that's the, the, the answer to that is the actress I spoke with were in uh, uh were already in america at that time one of the stories i found fascinating though was um i spoke as i mentioned before to mark aronson who is uh the son of um boris aronson the uh the set the, the broadway set designer and uh boris aronson's wife lisa jolowitz aronson had a sister in amsterdam who was in hiding a few doors down from the Franks at the same time, and um, and it, there was a and her husband was in the resistance, and she was able to um, pass as Gentile. Uh, she was in open hiding. She was able to pass, pretending passing herself with fake identification off as being of Indonesian extraction. So the set designers. And the, and the Lisa Jolowitz Aronson also 
was instrumental in doing some of the sets and doing some of the research. So she was, her family was directly impacted. Another person I spoke with was Eva Rubenstein, um, the daughter of the pianist Arthur Rubenstein. Eva Rubenstein uh, played Margaret Frank on Broadway and, you know, her family left um, Europe right um, very shortly after Kristallnacht and some of, you know, her family was left behind. Um, so they were, they were not, I, I did not talk to any survivors uh, who were directly involved in the production, but uh, there were direct impacts to the families of these performers. And yes, that's Eva Rubenstein, who after um, being uh, Margaret Frank on Broadway and doing a couple of other shows, uh, changed careers and is now a world-renowned photographer. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, how do you feel about the, about the charge that there were multiple versions of Anne's story? And the one that became mainstream was the one that did not show Anne's death in Bergen-Belsen, but ended before the camps. How do I, I mean, that's, I mean, I don't know if it's a charge, it's true. You know, it is true that the original version of this story was written by Meyer Levin, who did it as a television play, who did it as a radio play. Um, on the podcast, I actually include some audio from his original, uh, original play. And he also wrote a memoir about uh, his obsession with Anne Frank. And it was a protracted legal dispute about who had the rights to tell the story. It's, um, there was a play that was done on this topic of how um, his obsession with uh, Anne Frank. So, yeah, it's it's not that there is a charge that there was. A, it's it's something that happened. I understand why it was done. It was very much to be crass about it. It was a commercial decision um, to tell a story in a certain way. And it is a commercial decision that resulted in this play that we have that has had the influence that it had. And we it also is the result by result, it is a story that is more sentimental and perhaps less true than the actual story. So that is what, what we're left with. Thank you. Um, the next question, did you encounter any frustrations in your search for interviewees? Was there anybody in particular that you had hoped to speak with but could not? Um, I would have liked to speak with Richard Bieber who uh, played P Peter uh, Van Den in the film who um, I, I believe uh, became a follower of Transcendental Meditation and, and a documentary filmmaker, and just he doesn't really do interviews. Uh, as I mentioned, Dina Daron, who um, played, uh, she was, according to various sources, she, she did not originate the role of Anne Frank on Broadway. Um, she uh, was the understudy and took it over from Susan Strasberg. She is said to have been Joseph Schulkraut, the guy who played Otto Frank, his favorite aunt. I've, I, as I said, I'm trading WhatsApp message. I'm still trading WhatsApp with her messages. I, I'm sorry I haven't yet gotten to spoke, gotten to speak with any of the people who performed in the show in um, Europe or in South America. But I'm I'm still trying. So I, I found a lot of people, but you know. I'm not sure I would say I was frustrated, but I would have liked to have spoken to every living person who was involved in this production. And no, I did not get to do that. That's one way to ensure that a podcast never ends. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, I mean, I think, you know, a story is finished in a way when there's more to tell. I know that sounds kind of a contradiction, but it's kind of when you have told the complete story, but there's so much more you want to tell, that's kind of how you know it's done. I, I don't know, maybe that doesn't make sense to you. It makes sense to me. No, I think it makes sense. I think of, you know, watching a really good docu-series where it ends in the final episode, you're going, so what happens? You know, how does this all tie up? And the result is it doesn't all tie up. And that's not how life works. Yeah, 
and, and that's why I like included some bonus episodes. Like I, I really, it was a little frivolous for the first seven episodes, but I really wanted to know what happened to the cat that was original in the original cast. So we released a five minute episode about Mushi the cat, the uh, gray cat who um, appeared on Broadway and went on the national tour and turned out to be a very happy story, which I liked. It's always nice to be able to insert some of those. Yeah. I always ask my students, what lingering questions do you have for whatever reading or whatever whatever um, text we're doing? And they always have a lot of lingering questions. It's a good thing. Yeah. I have a question from Rona. Um, do you talk about the tree that Anne writes about in her diary? Um, I do not. Um, perhaps I should, but no, I, I do not. That, that does not... I. That did not make it into the podcast. Thank you. Can can uh, Rona elaborate a little bit of what would what might have? Rona, would you like to unmute yourself? Sure. Um, uh, don't know. To, okay. Yeah. So I'm actually from Amsterdam. Uh, my mm -hmm. family went through the war. My grandmother was actually in the bunk where Anna Frank was uh, sleeping. So I have some insight in some things that most people do not know. Um, but what happened was with the tree is it died and people wanted to um, save a branch of it and replant it. And it was a whole controversy of it about it because it cost so much money to do. But because it was such a big piece of Anna Frank's diary, they, they spent the money on it to replant mm -hmm. a piece of it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was very focused on the kind of dramatic interpretation and the effect on the people who were in the film and the play. So, yeah, if I had gone further into the diary, you know, I, I you know, there, there would be no way I would be finished by now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and I'm going to call on Leslie Shore. Thanks. I just wanted to comment on uh, Adam. You you mentioned that you didn't have any. You couldn't find anyone from Germany who had seen the play, and uh, I taught I taught at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Education three courses on on the Dyer Van Frank. I've connected with you, Adam, before, and mm -hmm. I, in my research, I found that the that the the play of the in Germany broke through to the consciousness of the German people as nothing had done before. And when it ended, they they didn't clap. They they just were absolutely frozen in their seats because it it nothing, nothing helped them to understand what had gone on more than that play. Right. Yeah, I um yeah, which in which is in some ways what even the kids who were in the show today said this reaction, it's you know, it's tough to know how to react at the end of the play, even like this many years later and this many miles away from Amsterdam, it's still this reaction of whether to clap or not to clap. And yeah, I, I did talk to someone who had seen the German production, but I did not talk to anyone who was in it in any of the 30 productions. And, you know, I, I would like to at some point, if possible. And what I found with my teachers that I taught them was that that having having investigated the, this content, having dived deeply into the story of Anne Frank has never left them. I'm, we're, I'm talking 20 years later, it, it, it has never left them. It changed their lives too, and the lives of their students. And I, I, it, it, it just has enormous, enormous impact. Which is why it somewhat times the question of whose version got told or whether something got changed along the way or sentimentalized becomes a little moot because if it did have this effect on this people, you know, those questions become, yes, his, as time goes on, a little less important and the impact that the show has is what becomes most important. To right, me. right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, next, I'm going to call on Jean and then Linda. Jean, are you able to unmute yourself? We'll come back to Jean, Linda, and then Jean. 
Ah, now I'm un I'm unmuted now. Okay, great. Um, I grew up in the fifties in New York City, and so that's a a kind of sui generis community for this issue. I mean, my mother worked at Columbia University, and my father worked at a small Jewish-owned wholesale sheet music company, and so they had dozens and dozens of, of Jewish friends and everyone had some had was a survivor or had someone who hadn't gotten out. When I got to high school, I had a classmate whose parents had numbers tattooed in their forearms. Um, there was a reality about the Holocaust in New York City that probably didn't exist in most places in the United States. Um, you know, that was a time when almost every New Yorker spoke Yiddish to some degree because it was just part of the analysis. But a, a few years back, I was a docent at the Anne Frank Center here in New York City, which didn't last very long, but it was an interesting experience um, because most of the kids coming in had no idea what we were talking about, or at least they had I an idea but it had no reality to them. Six million is not a comprehensible number. Nobody understands what six million means. And I think that's the power of the diary is that you don't have to think about six million. Think about one. Yeah. This is what one person experienced. And there are more people than you can count who had similar experiences, um, that this was real. And this was also a time, you said people pretending not to be Jewish, it was also a time when there were black people who were passing for white for exactly the same reason. Um, and so it's, it's such a huge story that I have sympathy for putting in that, stealing the loaf of bread scene yeah. because a book has hundreds of pages in which to make its point a play or a movie has maybe two hours and the need to put something in to the story that distills the emotional truth of the story that you only have a few minutes to communicate um is really powerful i mean i've never seen a biopic that didn't have scenes that didn't happen but the screenwriter has to do something to say this is the point this is the emotional reality of the story and it's true in its in its emotional power it is telling you something that is true it is telling you that these people were so desperate that they had to do these things. Yeah, and what um, you're, you're talking about is like the exact, the, what the, that kind of um, disagreement, that kind of conflict is exactly what's going on in the letters that are going back and forth between Anne Frank, Otto's father, and the creators of the play. That same kind of conflict that you're talking about, that same tension is going on in the correspondence where they're trying to figure out the best way to convey the story. And you're right. And um, fiction won out over nonfiction because in some way it told a true story. Well, and that's the thing. And it's interesting that, that Otto Frank was so upset about it because he didn't leave the diary to its truth either. He took many, many aspects of the story out because he didn't want his wife criticized because he didn't want to talk about Anne's, you know growing sexuality right. um because it was more it wasn't just romance <laughs> yeah. um and so to some degree he distorted the story more than this one scene yeah he's very if you look at his course, he is just he was very particular in how he wanted the story to be told, whether that was in and it, it it's it's fascinating to read the discussions as they go back and forth. Thank you. And Linda. Um, 
Thank you. I have forgotten two of my points already because I was so engrossed in listening. That happens. One point I wanted to make um, apropos German reactions. Um, I live in Wayland, Mass, and my older son, M. Hirsch, was very friendly with a young man by the name of Sasha von Bismarck. They grew up together, went to Harvard together, went on into life together. And um, the von Bismarck name, of course, is familiar to many of you. Um, and Sasha's grandmother took it upon herself. This must have been about, oh, hmm, 25 or so years ago to uh, bring the entire family, the extended family of von Bismarck's from around the world to Germany and began, I think she, she established a foundation of some sort, possibly um, educational to teach about the Holocaust. And I'm sure the, that the ripples have continued. I have not followed the family or the story, but that was highly significant. And I just wanted to share that. So thank you for this beautiful presentation. Thank you, and th thank you for sharing that as well. It's fascinating. Thank you. And the last question of the day will go to Anne. Hi, um, it's actually not strictly a question, but I did want to say this before while I'm here. Um, I actually just played Anne Frank. Um, we did a world premiere opera version of it here at Indiana University. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I just found out about that a couple of weeks ago. That's by Shirley yeah. McRon did the... Uh -huh. uh... Yeah. Um, my grandmother lives in Livingston and she called me and said, there's this thing from Kane University that's happening. You'd have to listen to it. And I haven't had a chance to listen to the podcast yet because we just finished the show and that was all I could um, deal with. But yeah, so we just we just did it. And I just wanted to share so much of what you said has resonated with me um, in terms of the, the outreach that we've been doing and the conversations I've had with people here. Um, Bloomington has a um a not insubstantial jewish population it's there's plenty going on but a lot of the um, high schoolers and middle schoolers that we spoke to um don't have any jewish people in their orbit um maybe this was one of the first times that they're hearing about this um and a lot of them said that um they felt like music and and probably in theater as well but but maybe opera or a musical version in particular um they said they felt that that would help people remember because when you put music to something it helps people and then also even just seeing it like you said earlier seeing it up on stage rather than reading reading about it um helps it helps it stick better so i had some folks come to me after the show and just say you know that it really hit home kind of in a way that it hadn't before um so we've had we've had some incredible experiences here um in the last two weeks <laughs> So, and I, I, I don't really want to derail the discussion by asking you the hundreds of questions I actually have for you right now. Um, <laughs> or perhaps we could save that conversation for a different time. Sure. Um, speaking as um, one of the former Jewish residents of Bloomington, Indiana, when my wife was teaching there. Wow. Um, and, but yeah, I'm interested in a lot in learning about that production and what the future of it holds, but I, sure. I did not learn about it till literally two weeks ago. Well, so I'm happy, I'm happy to be in touch if you'd like. Great. And I actually think, yes, yeah, surreptitiously, that was um, the best possible ending we could have come to. Uh, that was not a plant, everyone should know. Um, but it is, you know, remarkable to hear that, you know, we're in 2023 and, you know, the diary of Anne Frank is still gracing stages um, around the world and impacting um, young learners and young lives. Um, so on that note, Thank you so much for participating in today's program. You know, Adam, thank you for creating um, this podcast. I encourage everybody to go and listen, playing Anne Frank. Um, we will be sharing a list of the resources that were addressed tonight, um, probably tomorrow, as well as a link to the recording. And this will be shared on YouTube um, for folks who want to rewatch or share with others. And a big thank you to Shauna um, for her brilliance and her generosity um, in giving her time today um, to lead this conversation. So thank you so very much. And yes, thank you, Shauna, for and thank you to the audience for a spirited discussion. If anyone can contact me, discuss their memories or anything else with the show, um, 
you it's pretty easy to kind of find me at the forward so feel free to do so and in the meanwhile thanks shauna and thanks to dara and thanks to everybody absolutely everyone have a wonderful night and stay safe out there we'll speak to you soon take care bye, -bye. fabulous program thank you <laughs>